Hello, and welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Mike Regan, who is co-founder and chief of relationship development at Transact. And today we're going to talk about achieving sustainable transportation savings, practical advice for C-level executives. Now, you know, the quest to find, you know, transportation savings is an ongoing one for transportation and logistics executives. And uh, it's also something that's, you know, got the focus of C-level executives like CEOs and CFOs because of the impact that transportation costs have on the bottom line. But, um, you know, but the main challenge that a lot of companies are still struggling with is um, how do you sustain those transportation savings? So in other words, achieving transportation savings, there are many paths to doing that, but sustaining them in year two, year three and beyond, that's really the, the ongoing challenge a lot of companies still have. And that's going to be the focus of our uh, conversation today. I'm certainly happy to have Mike on the program. I've known Mike for, for many, many years, uh, and I'm sure that many of you uh, know Mike as well. He's pretty well known in the industry thanks to you know, the, his breadth of knowledge and experience and his involvement with various industry organizations. And he's also one of the thought leaders that I follow. Uh, I don't know if you watch his uh, two-minute warnings on YouTube, but if, if not, check it out. Always provide some great uh, insights into what's happening in the transportation industry. So with that, Mike, welcome to the program. Adrian, listen, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm really uh, looking forward to uh, engaging with you on this topic because I think it's critically important uh, based on what's going on that companies look at not just achieving savings, that's, that's got the high sizzle, but the hard work is how do I sustain those savings over year two, year three, just as you suggested there. So I'm looking forward to the dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's, got, let's go right to it. Like, like you said, I mean, there's, there's uh, multiple paths to achieving transportation savings. And certainly we, we've talked about it on this program. There's countless, you know, white papers and blog posts that kind of, you know, point the direction of how you can save, uh, you know, in transportation, whether it's everything from procurement to better consolidation, so on and so forth. But, but like, like we both just said, you know, sustaining those savings is, is, uh, is what this challenge. So, I mean, what are, what are some of the critical factors or capabilities that, you know, companies need to achieve sustained transportation savings? Well, first of all, Adrian, I think it starts with a commitment at the top. So uh, a lot of people, they, they get excited when you talk about achieving, you know, big time savings. You know, we can reduce your cost by 10, 15, 20 percent. But then you get down to the hard work of actually translating those, you know, theoretical savings into bottom line savings, you know, that are reflected on your financial statements. And that's why I, I encourage C-level executives to understand that this is not just a momentary quick pop type thing. It is something that you're going to have to continue to be engaged in over a sustained period of time. Now, the level of engagement can vary. But one of the things I want to remind folks is that it, when you're talking about transportation savings, it's what I call a get your hands dirty type thing. And what I mean by that, Adrian, is that, you know, when you're talking about transportation savings, you're not talking about 10000 here or 20000 there. What you're talking about is $50 or $100 or $150 on a particular freight move. But that freight move occurs hundreds or thousands of times during the month. So I, I, I emphasize to folks that if you want to have sustained savings, it requires a commitment from the top. I think it also requires a level of accountability throughout the organization. And specifically, what I mean by that is, you know, in the initial euphoria of all these transportation savings, everyone's really jazzed and excited. But then, you know, everyone has activities. The, the syndrome of having 10 pounds of activities to shove into a five pound bag. So they can kind of lose excitement. But when that excitement wanes, what are the KPIs that you're looking at that A, let you know that the excitement's waning, and B, indicating what I need to do to get back on track so that each and every month I'm doing a great job of managing my transportation spend. And that brings me to my third one. You know, you've got a commitment at the top, you've got accountability, and then the third thing is communication throughout the organization. Uh, just this week, I was meeting with a bunch of senior executives from a company, and when we talked about the silotization of their organization, you know, everyone wants to say, no, we're one happy organization that works seamlessly, but truthfully speaking, you know, just the normal day-by-day -day grind of operations, you have people going into silos, so you have your sales, you have your procurement, 
you have your supply chain, you've got your finance and accounting. But what people need to understand is by coming together and communicating, the salespeople will have an understanding how their decisions affect transportation spend. The procurement and uh, purchasing folks will understand the things that they are doing that impact my transportation cost. So if I communicate that throughout the organization, couple that with a commitment from the top and a level of accountability, I can in fact create a scenario that will basically create those savings year one, year two, year three, and it'll get better each and every year. You know, Mike, I agree with all, all those points. And, and I think, you know, you, you listen to it, and it sounds kind of like common sense in some ways, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not, um, you know, it's not rocket science, yet, you know, companies are still struggling with this. I mean, what, what are the main roadblocks to companies doing the things you just talked about? Well, first of all, I think the uh, topic that has to be discussed, uh, just recently here, I was talking to the CEO of a, you know, multi-billion dollar company. He's talking about how much, you know, we got to get our transportation spend under control, which is why he was talking to us. But one of the things I highlighted for him is the impact of culture. And practically speaking, you know, everyone gives lip service to saying, yeah, I want to do this, I want to do this. But when the rubber meets the road, they will basically honor their culture. And at CSCMP a couple years ago, Howard Schultz from Starbucks said, look, you need to face reality. Culture beats strategy any day of the week. So one of the main roadblocks that we have to address if we want to achieve sustainable saving is will we make the changes or can we have the uh, things that we need to address within our culture brought up to the surface so that people do the right thing rather than the thing that they've been doing all these years. I could give you countless examples of how this impacts transportation costs but number one is, uh, you know, address the cultural issues. The second thing that you need to take a look at is, you know, we talked in the last question about accountability and KPIs. You know, what happens when things go wrong? I, I like to emphasize that, you know, that question. Now, I, I assume, and I think most people that are watching this, Adrian, would say that no one volitionally wants to screw up. I, I don't believe anyone wakes up in the morning and says, boy, I wonder how I can do an awful job here at work. But practically speaking, they don't want to do an awful job and they don't want to do wrong things, but occasionally wrong things happen. And when wrong things happen, you know, do I conduct a root cause analysis? Do I give people the benefit of the doubt? And do I ask this question? Do they have the tools and the training they need to do the job right? And, you know, the analogy that I give to everybody, I mean, we've all been through school and we've all sat through exams. Well, how would you feel if you walked into a class, the first day of class, and the teacher hands you the final exam and says, good luck, 90% of your grade will be based on how you do on this final exam. You'd be scrambling and say, I don't know. Well, I see that scenario in many companies when we're seeing the kind of you want to call it rogue spending, maverick spending, or the kind of things that sub-optimize your supply chain and transportation areas, you know, people don't know, which is why they need the training and they need the tools. You know, great. I mean, and, and, I, and we're going to talk about technology a little bit because obviously those tools, uh, I think, play a key role in providing that visibility that you talked about that ultimately links to uh, the, uh, um, uh, the accountability uh, side of things. And then I think the culture piece, I was there at that CSCMP conference and I think um, a lot of people took, took those words from Schultz uh, to heart because I think it's so true yeah. and people recognize, people recognize it. And it goes back to your earlier point in terms of getting that buy-in from, from, the, from the top because ultimately it's the, the senior leadership that sets the culture, the, the tone of the company's yeah. culture. Um, you, know, you, get, you get to work with a lot of companies, you know, different industries, and, and not only within, you know, they're at Transact, but even you know, coming across in, in some of the organizations that, that you're involved with. I mean, when you look at companies that are leading the way, in achieving sustained, you know, transportation savings. I mean, is there a common thread between them? You know, in other words, how did they overcome those barriers that you talked about? Boy, that, that is a great question and one that I frequently ask myself because, you know, we're fortunate. We see some companies that are, are doing it well. Uh, what do you want to call it? World class or whatever, you know, uh, term you want to append to their practices. They're doing a very, very good job. Uh, a couple of things we've noted. 
first of all, uh, you know, Jim Collins talks about having the right people on the bus. I look at it a little bit differently. Uh, I assume that when we're in an organization, everyone's in the same boat, but are people rowing in the same direction? So what I see happening there is in organizations that have, you know, that are doing it well, world class or whatever, uh, there's a level of communication that I referred to in the answer to your first question there, Adrian. You know, people are on the same page and they're rowing in the same direction. Uh, one other thing that I think is important that a lot of companies uh, could probably spend some time thinking about is celebrating the wins. Uh, you know, a lot of companies, uh, or not a lot of companies, but I've been in environments where basically people are told to do more with less. You know, cut your budget here, do this or do that. And they go ahead and do it, and then the next task comes and says, great job, now do it again or do it this. No one takes time to celebrate the wins and take a step back and ask the question, what did we do right? Uh, you know, one of my mentors, a gentleman by the name of Bob Buford, was very close with Peter Drucker. And Peter Drucker has, you know, his five questions. Uh, but, you know, some of the other questions that Drucker used to ask are, are there things that we need to stop doing? Not only what are we doing now, but are there things that we need to stop doing? And world-class organizations have a way of pulling themselves back and being able to ask themselves the question, why are we doing this? And do we need to continue doing this? And if so, is there a better way of doing this? And that better way of doing this is emblematic from my perspective, Adrian, of a level of curiosity. And, and I'm not just saying this to you as, as just an idle compliment, but one of the things I love about your talking logistics is that you promote that level of curiosity, that level that says there's a different way of doing it, and it may be a better way for your organization. So organizations that have sustainable savings are always looking to get better, and they use that fuel of curiosity to drive a lot of the uh, questioning and initiatives that they undertake. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, no, I and, and, and I agree with um, you, you know that point about celebrating wins and um, you know particularly. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of transportation happens in the front lines, right? With a lot of people yeah. that are you know dispatchers or planners, so on and so forth. And a lot of times, you know, they may become disconnected in terms of how what what their role is in achieving the strategic and financial goals of the company, right? But so I think to your point, I think highlighting those wins and really showing the people in the front lines how their function and what they're doing relates to the strategy and the financial objectives of the company, I think uh, instills that um, uh, proactiveness, you know, to continue to do better. And I think, you know, to your point, always questioning the status quo is something that I see as well, you know, with, uh, you know, leading companies. Um, so, Okay, let's say. I can interrupt just for a moment, Adrian. Absolutely, go ahead. You know, there, there is one other thing that uh, I, I encourage companies to take a look at. And that is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, saving money in transportation is really a detail business. Because it's, like I said, who gets excited about 50 bucks? Who gets excited about 100 bucks? But when that 100 bucks is occurring a thousand times, you know, all of a sudden I can go, wow, you know, it's like Ev Dirksen. One of our senators here from Illinois in the 60s used to say, you know, a billion here and a billion there, pretty soon you're talking real money. Well, I like to remind people on transportation, you know, a hundred here, a thousand here, pretty soon you're talking about real money. And, and that's where I get into that level of detail in a willingness to take a deep dive, get my hands dirty with the expectation that I can create an outcome that is better than the one I'm experiencing today. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just think that's also a key trait that we've seen in companies that do it well. No, that's a great, that, that, that's a great point, you, you know, because it does, um, it does add up over time. And, you know, and I think when, when times are good, you know, that $50 loss or $100 yeah. loss, you know, kind of, uh, uh, it kind of falls through the cracks, but it's a lot of times those problems rise to the surface when, you know, the economy turns, uh, you know, in the negative direction. And then you see what you've been doing all along, right? And, and what impact. Absolutely, having. absolutely. Okay, so let's, let's say you know, you've, you've overcome those barriers that we talked about. You, know, you get the upper management uh, you know, buy-in, you, you've, you've aligned your, your culture you know, accordingly. I mean, what, what needs to be in place now to kind of make that change actually happen? Well, 
one of the things that I, I, I think, you know, we can look at this at different levels. At a, a high level, Adrian, and this really could be included in some of the other questions that you've asked me. I think one of the key questions that we need to ask as an organization is how do we view transportation? And specifically, is it something that we can use as an asset, as a competitive differentiator that helps us win more business, or is it a necessary evil? And, and I think that really sets the table for the commitment and resources I'm willing to dedicate to this particular function. If I view it as a necessary evil, you know, just simply get stuff in and get stuff out the door, that's going to have a much different impact on my willingness to spend money than if I view it as a competitive differentiator. And, and one of the things that I just want to highlight that I, I think is really, you know, I, I'm writing these articles about predictions for 2017. For some reason, over the last three months, and I don't know if it's some kind of divine orchestration or whatever, but I'm hearing a lot of people talk about execution. And when I say execution, you know, it's, it's not like uh, that Bossidy said, you know, what did he think about a staff's execution? And he said, I'm, I'm in favor of it. I'm talking about our ability to actually do what needs to be done to satisfy our customers. Yesterday, I was talking with a gentleman and he said, Mike, look, here's my saving money is great. He said, but let me give it to you at a real basic level. He said, I need to get the right product out the right door at the right time to the right place at the right cost with the right follow up in order for us to do well as an organization. And he said, we're not there yet. So, you know, that is to me is, is someone that understands that transportation is something that's important in helping him satisfy the customer. And, and that's, you know, step one in the journey. Uh, the second thing I, I encourage people to do is I don't need to be a subject matter expert in transportation. That's why I have people in my organization, right? But I do need to have at least a surface level understanding how transportation and supply chain issues affect the customer experience within my organization. Because when I'm talking about the customer experience, my, what I have seen, Adrian, is that people are more inclined to write checks and dedicate resources when it's the customer experience. And so how does transportation and supply chain impact that customer experience? And, and then the other thing, as I mentioned before, Am I providing the tools and training within my organization so that my people have an opportunity to be successful? So that the associates within our organization can in fact delight the customers. Now, one of my good friends is, is Ken Blanchard and talks about raving fans and you know this type of thing. And, and one of the things that I take a look at, every CEO wants to delight his customers right? I mean, I've yet to see the CEO that says, ah, who cares about those customers? Just give them what we have. I mean, everyone wants to delight the customers, but it requires an investment to be able to do that. And in order to make that investment, if you're viewing it as a competitive differentiator like transportation can be, you're going to do a lot better and achieve those sustainable savings. I, I love long answer there. I apologize. <laughs> No, 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 no. I love, I love the connection between transportation and delighting customers or the, the, the customer experience. And certainly that's something that I've seen as well. I've, I've written about it. I'm talking logistics as well. Yeah. In terms of how over the past few years, you know, going back, you know, a decade or a year ago, and unfortunately some companies still view it that way. If you're viewing logistics and transportation specifically only as a cost center, um, it's going to limit your ability to be competitive moving forward. But if you truly view it, as an opportunity to drive a competitive advantage and to delight customers and enhance the customer experience, that's what's gonna open you know, the door and that's what's gonna generate some of those what if questions, what could we be doing uh, you know, differently? And, and one of the things I do see shifting is, uh, you know, for what it's worth, uh, I, I don't necessarily see people tell me that transportation is a necessary evil. I mean, most people say, yeah, transportation is important. But what I do see is a gap between what they say and what they do. 
They say it's important, but their actions basically say, look, I'm going to get by bare minimum and, uh, you know, I'll give it to a third party and a third party will make my problems magically disappear. It requires a level of understanding, engagement, commitment, all the things that we talked about right. in order to have a, a well-run organization. Right. So let's talk about the tools now. You mentioned, uh, you just mentioned tools, which, which obviously includes technology. Hey, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? I mean, what is the role of technology and what capabilities should companies look for in, in uh, you know, solutions? Well, Adrian, I've got a couple of points there. First of all, uh, as I'm talking with some uh, C-level executives, one of the things I've highlighted is that the changes over the last couple of years have probably been more disruptive and impactful than I've ever seen in my life in the business. And, and you've done a great job of using talking logistics to highlight that. And, and one of the reasons why I, I just want to bring up a small point is that w the way change can occur, it can be like volcanic or earthquake, sudden, or it can be incremental. But in a short period of time, those incremental changes can be volcanic. And if you're not paying attention, then it can catch you by surprise. So some of the things that we're seeing out there in today's marketplace, I mean, there a lot of organizations talk about lean, right? Uh, you know, one of my favorite stories, I was at a company in, in the fall uh, up in Michigan, and they were all into lean. They even had a chart, a chart that talked about how to clean toilets in their organization. And they had a, a, a toilet cleaning cart that they had in a supply cabinet. And they had all these things. Well, I walk out on the receiving docks and the shipping docks, guess what's missing? Any kind of chart. So I concluded that cleaning toilets is more important than transportation. And because of that, I'm willing to live with a lot of waste in my organization when it comes to managing logistics and transportation and supply chain issues. Now that runs contrary to every lean principle, right? The five S's of lean and I could go on and on. But the reality of it is, is technology today is an enabler to eliminate waste in manual effort. And practically speaking, I was at a, a place here and they had over 20 people, 20 people that a part of their job involved booking freight. Now I asked the question, why are we doing that? And the reason is, is because, well, that's the way we've always done it. And with technology, they could basically take so much time away from, you know, and those people could be used in much more productive ways. So things, what kind of technology are we seeing? Well, obviously, you've done a great job of talking about the TMS. And, you know, we love our Constellation TMS product. It's a great tool for helping companies automate all the functions associated with transportation. There's changes, Adrian, that are coming along in the communication area. So, you know, as an organization, 93% of our transactions are done electronically. Well, we're looking at with APIs and things like that. How are we going to expand that and get that? Because I think what you're going to see in the future is that if you don't take advantage of the technology that's out there, if you be, if you're a late adopter, you know, the book, Crossing the Chasm, you know, that, that whole book, right? If you're a late adopter, your competitor is going to run over you. And just to give you a practical example, one area just, we see the area where dynamic pricing is going to come into place. And what I mean for those of you in, in, in your audience there, Adrian, that are not familiar with that, we see the trucking industry going to an environment where they have the ability to change prices instantaneously, a la the airlines. I was in the boardroom at United Airlines last year. United Airlines reprices every seat on the plane after one seat has been sold. Think about that just for a moment. Well, if I'm a trucking company, an LTL company in particular, or even a truckload carrier, and I've got the ability to change my pricing, you need technology in order to accept that information from the carrier. So if you're flying solo or manual and you're not taking advantage of APIs and things like that, you're at a strategic disadvantage coming right out of the chute. So that technology is going not just is it incredibly important today, but it's going to become even more important as the speed of business continues to increase. Because one of the things that technology does is what I call the adaptability factor. 
when I have a curveball thrown at me, I know you're a big baseball fan and, and you've written about your kids in Little League. When I have a fastball or a curveball, I need to be able to adapt and change my swing in order to be able to hit the ball. And from my vantage point, that technology is the tool that enables me to adjust to the pitch that's being thrown to me. I, I don't know if that baseball analogy is relevant, but I know you have a passion for it. So I, I thought I'd bring it up. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a great, I think it's a great analogy. And I think it, it relates to, you know, what a lot of folks are talking about today in the industry. You know, it's kind of a buzz term, but, you know, people talk about the, the need to be flexible and adaptable, right? And, and, and the technology needs to be flexible and adaptable because of all these changes that are, you know, taking place in, in the industry. I think the bottom line is that, you know, the days of managing transportation with spreadsheets and fax machines are, are long gone. And unless you're keeping a strong pulse and in investing in technology, um, you're going to be, uh, you know, left behind, uh, you know, very quickly moving forward. Um, so let's talk about the time we have remaining here. Let's talk about a little bit about, you know, the role of third party, you know, partners. I mean, a lot of companies reach out to companies such as yours to kind of assist them in this process. What is the role of a third party, you know, partner and what capabilities should companies look for in a partner? Well, that's, that's a great question. And I think there are some key attributes that will have a significant impact on the success of the partnership or alliance with the third party. Uh, first one, Adrian, it's not something that a lot of people spend a lot of time talking about or thinking about. And I, I think it's a topic that some people actually want to run away from. But one of the things I think is incredibly important is a synchronization of values between the organizations. Is the way your third party does business consistent with the way I do business? Is the way they treat their associates, is the way they treat their suppliers, the cost, et cetera, are the values in sync first and foremost. The second that I, I think is critically important is the level of experience and expertise they bring to the table. Uh, you know, I mentioned I was talking to a company here very recently and I was listening to the back and forth and it was obvious to me was what I called earlier the silotization within the organization. And that's why one of the things I was, we've been doing a lot, we have a thing we call our, our rapid assessment process, is it's a dynamite process where we cause people to take a step back, take a look at this is the way we're doing business and then ask the question is this how we want to do business? And one of the questions we like to ask, and, and something that I think is important, if time and talent were no issue, is this the way we would be running our business? Let's work backward. Let's ask ourselves the question, is time and talent and treasure, you know, call it the three T's or whatever, you know, if they were not an issue, if I could spend the money that I wanted and get the people that I wanted and had the time to do it, would I want to do it better? And oftentimes people say, well, of course I would, Mike. Who would answer no to that question? Then I say, well, then let's, then we can have a dialogue about saying, well, now we induce some factors and time, talent, and treasure is a factor, but let's come up with some scenarios that allow us to go after the slow fat rabbits, the low hanging fruit, all those consulting terms that people treasure. And now I can create a scenario as a third party that you may not have been familiar with. And that's because of the experience and expertise. So first one is values, second one is experience and expertise, and then the third one is resources. Do they have the resources to be able to effectively do what I need to have done? I mean, right now, Adrian, there's a, and I would just ask your audience to really think about this, okay? Uh, there's a debate going on within the industry. If I'm a, a shipper, do I go to a managed services solution? Or do I go into an environment where I get my associates the tools they need so that they can effectively control what we're doing within an organization? And, and I think that's a question that has a direct impact on the success of that third party relationship. Because if I have people in the organization that want to control it and I make the decision to put it into a managed environment where their control is reduced, don't be surprised when those folks work to sabotage the managed solution capability. And I think that's just one of the realities. So, you know, what we're talking about there, these are some of the critical factors. And, and one other thing I, I just want to emphasize, if I could go back to your previous question, but it is important here. 
is how can the third party help me move my business forward? You know, one of the things that we offer is our telescope reporting product. It's a product that we just introduced last year. And one of the reasons I love it is because it takes the whole issue of analytics, which is something that you've done a dynamite job covering, it takes the issue of analytics to a completely different level. And you know, we haven't talked about big data and perhaps on another session we could talk about big data, but one of the issues that companies are seeing with analytics is it creates a capability that allows me to see patterns. And once I can define patterns, I can address what I call the chaos in my organization. So, you know, very recently here, I was, I was talking to a company and it was obvious they were, you know, in the spot market over 30% of their moves. And, you know, that's because they have so many orders that are dropped on their desk that same day that have to, and we went through it and I, I was like, do you really think that's how your customers operate their business? Do you think your customers like wake up in the morning and say, geez, I need to order product from Adrian Gonzalez today. Or is there a chance that maybe they say, this is what I expect to buy from Adrian over the next four to six to eight, 12 weeks. And once I see that pattern, I can then address some issues and do much better planning within my supply chain. And that's also a capability that a third party brings to the table, as well as some of the technology that we were talking about. Yeah, a lot of great points. I particularly like the, the alignment of values, which I think underscores the point you made earlier about the importance of culture. So it's not only the importance of culture within your own company, but then the alignment of culture with a, a third party. And then I Absolutely. think, and, and one of the things uh, when you were talking there uh, that, that I hear from a lot of shippers, uh, particularly when they're looking at partners is, you know, tell me something I don't already know, right? So it's how to, to your point about how can we move our business forward? How can we move our operations forward? How can we create a differentiation? So, so I think, um, you know, bringing the talent, the tools uh, and the insight to help them to tell the client something that they don't already know and help them move forward, I think is, is uh, critical as well. Well, could I give you one other illustration of where a third party is, can be very useful? Sure. And that is, you know, companies like Transact are in the market each and every day buying freight. And as a result of that, we are very sensitive to changes in the network. And, and you know, recently I was talking to a senior logistics person and I said, you know, if you're doing business the way you were doing business three years ago, even, you know, it used to be five years, three years, and I could even make the argument two years, you really need to go back and assess, is that the best way of doing business? And people say, well, Mike, can you give me a practical illustration? Well, you know, over the past couple of years, Old Dominion has significantly changed their network. YRC has significantly changed their network. XPO is different than the way Conway was when, you know, after the acquisition. XPO has spun off their truckload group, what used to be the old CFI. You know, so you take a look at this and there are all these changes that are occurring in the marketplace. Now, I'm a shipper and I go to market with my sourcing event once a year. Is it logical to assume that I have the expertise of a, of a C.H. Robinson, a Transplace, a Transact, uh, all these different organizations, is it possible that maybe they understand some key factors that are going to basically translate into lower rates or better service capabilities than I may be aware of? And, and the net result of that is, you know, a while ago we were talking to a company about conducting a sourcing event and they were very proud of themselves. They did it on their own, Adrian, and they saved 3%. And they were, you know, just about breaking their arms, patting themselves on the back. Well, what they had given us an ability, you know, data, and we had benchmarked that data, and we thought there was 12 to 14% out there with our eyes closed. So I, I said to the VP of transportation, congratulations, you saved 3%, but you left about 10% on the table. Have a nice day. <laughs> you know what? And those are the types of, uh, you know, factors that a good third party can at least work with you. And even if you choose not to retain a third party, Adrian, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, the way we've built our business and the way others have built their business as well is, you know, if people come and ask for us, uh, ask for help, we want to see you do well. Now, that may not translate into a project for us right away, 
but it has meant significant goodwill over the years so that people say, well, you know, Transact helped us out on this particular project. They didn't charge us anything for it. You know, like the benchmarking we're doing today. We've done a lot of benchmarks for people just to give them a snapshot of where they're at in the marketplace. You know, for the, you know, for a lot of these companies, there's no cost associated with it. Why would we do that? Well, hopefully in the future, you know, it generates goodwill and people remember that stuff and it's a good investment. Yeah, no, great, great, great point. I mean, sometimes you do have to provide, you know, some, some insight and some visibility in terms of what the opportunities are to kind of get the, um, the, the wheels moving. Um, you know, we, we're kind of running short on time here, Mike. So I'm, I'm going to go right to my last question here. You know, as a way to wrap up, I mean, what questions, you know, should a CEO ask to determine their next steps? I mean, what action should they take, you know, to start moving, you know, forward uh, in this area? Uh, well, that's, that's a really great question. And I just had that discussion, as I mentioned, with the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, am I happy with where we're at today? First of all, am I happy? I mean, do I think things are doing well? Uh, the second question is, uh, if I do a deep dive and really take a look at, or have people come in and do a deep dive, what are they going to find? Are there any quote unquote skeletons that I need to be aware of? Uh, for example, the CEO that I was talking to, they run a private fleet. Uh, he's finding out some information about their private fleet that, you know, basically isn't filtering up to, uh, filtering up to his office. Uh, so the third thing is, you know, can I define my current state? You know, in lean, we talk about current state, future state. Well, it's great to talk about the future state, but in order to get to the future state, I need to understand the current state in the what that bridge is going to look like to get me to my future state. In a lot of companies, Adrian, uh, we could give you several examples where they really, really don't understand their current state. And when we go and do that sometimes, Adrian, I just want to point this out. If your response back to me is, you don't understand our business very well, guess what? That tells me the problems are much bigger than you know you realize because in many instances, we understand the business, but really, we don't need to understand your business to understand that you're using more carriers than you need to do. We don't need to understand your business that you need the TMS or a yard management system or uh, you know all these other capabilities because we've seen company after company put these tools in place and benefit from them. So, you know, can I define my current state? How do I get to my future state? Those are some of the things that uh, I'd be asking for. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Those, those are all, those are all great questions to, to get the process started. Uh, well, Mike, you know, like I always say at the end of all our episodes, we always just manage to scratch the surface uh, on these topics, but I think you provided some great uh, insight and uh, words of advice for, for folks in terms of how to, you know, get started in, in, in making sure that they are sustaining the transportation savings that they, they're achieving. And uh, certainly we'd love to have you back uh, in the near future here to maybe, you know, talk through some uh, case study examples or some other examples to kind of shed more light on, on this area. But again, thank you very much for making the time to be with us today. Adrian, listen, thank you very much. And it's, a, it's an honor and pleasure to be with you and keep up the great work. You do a great job of uh, covering the, uh, the industry and the critical issues. Thanks for your time. And have a great 2017. Great, you too. And uh, I want to thank uh, those of you who joined us today. Um, if you are watching this episode on demand on the Transact website or Talking Logistics and you've got a question for Mike, I'm sure uh, if you post a question there, I'm sure that Mike will be more than happy to answer via that medium. Again, thank you all and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.